So throwing it back to you, um, and I think this might be a short answer, but it seems like that's a big difference between what the two of us do. That, that's almost antithetical. You want to know that process. You need to follow the rules. Yeah. That, that's what gives you a sense of that you're doing the style correctly uh, or that you're doing the style in a legitimate way. Yeah. Um, the, the, I think the similarity is that the, the farther along you are, the looser you can hold those rules because you're so baptized in them that they're going to inform what you do, whether you think about them or not. You know, sort of like us sitting here, we're both native English speakers. Neither of us, until I bring this up now, has thought about adverbs or sentence structure. We, we don't need to think about it. That doesn't mean it isn't there. It's just so internalized that, that it hasn't come up as an issue. And I, I do think you're right that in the historic field, it takes longer and you you can afford to forget less, but the same process does take place uh, where years and years and years of hearing things and knowing how it all works kind of come together and you can you can just play. But yeah, I, I do. I, I, native speaker of that language. Yeah, yeah language. More, more and more. Bob it, or swing. Or, yeah, it, it's more. I think it's harder to get there in the classical realm because even a beginning jazz student is immediately learning things by ear, you know, whether it's just 12 bar blues, they're learning to get off the page. Hopefully, you know, with a good teacher, they're learning to get off the page. Um, you know, our, our mutual friend, um, Brad from Columbus, Ohio, um, he talks about on page and off page musicians. And I think this is a very helpful way of talking about it. Classical musicians are so on page, uh, they come from schools where, you know, you study the score with a microscope and you talk about every dot and stuff. Um, and you respect the score as this almost like scripture or something, this word from on high, you know, Beethoven said it, uh, that it forms you into someone who doesn't really think for yourself about how music is made. Even if you know a lot of theory and you know a lot of cheering facts about Roman numerals, you don't really think in real time about how to build this stuff. You think in real time how to remember it and, and reconstruct it. And so to take that all away and say, now you're, you're the one who has to construct it, that's like going back to kindergarten for classical musicians. And so it just takes longer for them. You know, many of them come to it in adulthood and now they have to go back and learn this stuff. It just takes way longer to get that same level of comfort and fluency as opposed to a kid who grows up going to jam sessions uh, and doesn't have to sort of relearn anything. So that's, that's one of the big challenges, right. is just getting over ourselves. Right, and that brings me to the question of where did you start? I know you're kind of an exceptional character because you were already improvising. And then, you know, what's the first thing you do with a student who might yeah. be wanting to learn to improvise in a classical or historical way? Yeah, um, I have a very normal education as a classical pianist. I went to big state schools and got the regular performance degrees. And I have a normal job as a piano professor. So I'm, I really have no business doing any of this. Um, probably I would say it's because I have a very short attention span. And I just started to get uncomfortable with the static quality of the way classical music is done. I love classical music. I love the repertoire. I love the history. I love all of that. And I have a lot of heroes who just play the same Bach, Beethoven, and Brahms year in, year out. I mean, it's great. I love it. But for me, I just, to say that everybody's going to play the same thing from the list, note for note, year after year after year, to me, my soul just dies. And so I actually started learning jazz for myself a number of years ago, just quietly reading and practicing. And, and then I would try a number or two on a, you know, to mix together with Beethoven or something. Uh, and, and after a while, I just thought, you know, what if you could take that spontaneity of you play the first chord without knowing where this piece is even going to go? You know, that leaping off the cliff uh, feeling. Uh, what if that could be taken into classical music? And the more I started looking into it, the more I thought, well, this more I realized this is what they originally did. Uh, 
This is how they were trained. They did improvise. And our age is kind of a, a bizarre outlier that we, all we do is reproduce and recite. So that really led me into exploring more and more and wondering, could this become something that we actually do on stage? Could it be something that we teach? Um, could it be something that becomes available to a lot of people? So that's really where it came from. Sheer boredom. Right. And then I guess my question is, you know, besides purchasing all of your books, including the forthcoming one, what would be the first step for somebody who's improv curious? <laughs> um, the way I teach it now is I teach the Partimento system, which was taught in the Neapolitan conservatories, uh, Naples, Italy, and then uh, also in other places in Italy, like Bologna and Rome. And then it was taken. They just stole the whole thing when they founded the Paris Conservatory. They took the entire Italian system, just boxes and boxes of materials and just started the Paris Conservatory. And so you can see it continuing uh, all the way up to WC and Ravel. They're still using some of the same materials. Uh, and what Partimento is, it's where you learn the whole language, the harmonic language, by playing only from bass lines. And this overlaps with jazz in kind of a fascinating way, because in jazz, you learn from chord charts, right? You have this minimal skeletal information, and you're supposed to know all this stuff that goes with it. So if, if it says C-sharp minor 7, F9, F minus 9, uh, B major 7, like you're supposed to know a whole bunch of things about that, Um and what a jazz musician knows, aha, that's a two, five, one, and it's in the key of B. And instead of playing this chord, I could actually substitute this chord. And here's the scales that are going to go with it. So from this tiny little shorthand, you know all this stuff that'll, and, and you know how to play a hundred ways. Partimento is the same thing. It's a bass line that has a range of correct upper voice accompaniments, not one correct thing, but a range and you learn to piece those things together in real time. So that's actually where I start. I start with the 10 partimenti of Giovanni Furno, who was one of the teachers in, in Naples. And that's where the students really learn this idea of just looking at a bass and going, aha, I, I see what I can do. So I, I, I tell them it's a three-step process, recognize, realize, stylize. You recognize by the way the bass is moving, what the implied harmonies are. You realize them in block chords. You just chunk them out. And then you stylize. You start to break it up into different voices and different rhythms. Uh, so that's where I tell people to go first. And then after that, more difficult partimento and stylization and then counterpoint. So I'm going to ask you the same question. Um, let's say a classical player comes to you. Somebody, somebody who really can play. You know, they've played you know, maybe you have a degree in music, in piano, and but they've never, ever played jazz. What, what's the first thing that you give them? Yeah, so this is a great question. And I'm working on a book that's in its final processes uh, for just this student. Um, mm -hmm. So, you know, I should be qualified to answer it, but it's an incredibly difficult question because there's all these things that you have to uh, start to internalize. You have to, A, be able to read chord symbols. B, understand jazz rhythm and swing rhythm and articulation, and C, start having some kind of an encounter with improvisation, right? So there's not one right answer, there's multiple fronts, you know, you're almost fighting a war on all of these different fronts. Um, but, you know, probably the first thing, the first couple things that I do, um, we, I like to start people with um, what I call drone improvisations, where you just play maybe a low fifth, and just have them improvise. And usually I start on C so that they, you know, with a C major scale so that we don't have to really think about notes and just have them start playing. And then I give small little focus prompts. Um, and at this point, we're not even thinking about the style of jazz. I'm just trying to get them to improvise melodies that are intentional, that make sense, um, that have some variety in them. So I'll tell you some of the very first focus prompts that I like to give people when they're improvising. Um, the first and arguably the most important, even though it's simple, is are you actually listening to yourself when you improvise? Um, because so many students, especially from a classical background, as they start to improvise, 
uh, get into this, you know, they're just like, I'm doing it. They're wiggling their fingers. They're playing yep. the notes, but it's not connecting orally at all. Um, and so the first thing, you know, and I'll, I'll do a little, just I'll put on my timer for a minute and I'll say, okay, here's a minute. You have to improvise on C and intensely listen to yourself and actually register everything you're playing. Um, a second thing, and this also seems so basic, but it's so important. Do your phrases have clear beginnings and endings? You know, are you actually playing in phrases or are you playing what I call a diarrhea improvisation mm -hmm. where you basically are just playing a continuous stream of notes? Um, and a third one, which starts getting a little bit more technical is, are you playing with a variety of hand positions? Um, because a lot of students, even really advanced classical players, as they start improvising, do what I call the crab, which is basically just kind of staying in this exact same hand position and not using all the capabilities that they've learned by practicing scales, which involve crossing over and crossing under, or by expanding their hand, or by kind of keeping it in a more spread position. Um, and so, you know, I start with these kind of basic principles of what it should look like to improvise the piano you know, in part just to get them feeling like they can improvise, feeling like they can get into a little bit of a flow while improvising, getting it to be a little bit less scary, um, and then starting to build these positive habits. The other things that we would do in early jazz lessons um, are, you know, talk about swing style, play some scales in swing style, um, really try to get the eighth note articulation correct, which is, you know, a real re-education for a lot of classical pianists who are used to playing eighth notes even and thinking of the weight being on the beat. Um, you know, we're now going to play uneven eighth notes with the weight going off the beat, so it's really kind of difficult. Um, and then, you know, we do talk about the theory, the maybe the recognized part of your, uh, of your triptych, um, where, you know, we'd start looking at lead sheets um, and, uh, and, you know, figure out how to decode all of these chord symbols and block out the chords. Um, now, the fourth thing, which is so important, and I've put, um, put this in every single chapter of my new book, is there's got to be some listening. Jazz is an oral art form. And, you know, we, as teachers, it can be so easy. You know, there's so much to do. <laughs> there's so much to explain. Um, but actually hearing jazz and being able to kind of even just follow along with that lead sheet and get the style in your ear, um, I'm not being a very good teacher if I'm not including that in my curriculum. Um, so that's kind of, I guess I, I guess I now listed a fourth front of the war that I'm fighting, but there's a lot to do for a student who comes in for their first jazz lesson.